Good morning, uh, everyone, again, for this uh, morning session, morning in France, about uh, FTOZ approach. So we will do this morning's demonstration of the FTOZ approach that we have uh, shown yesterday uh, during the lectures. Feel free to ask a question like, uh, like yesterday using the Q&A box. Uh, we will answer your question during the during the demonstration. Thanks again to our sponsor. We have Dice who gave us a microscope and uh, Medtronic who gave us a, a drill, the new drill actually that we test today. And uh, one slide about uh, acknowledgements for body donation. We have to remember that uh, some person donates their body for us uh, to work to improve our technique and uh, it's something we have definitely to to respect and to think about so let's uh, let's start with the with the demonstration so as i said yesterday the incision has to go quite uh, low uh, for an ftoz approach the tragus is around here, so you can go lower to the tragus, but uh, the incision must stay as posterior as possible along the tragus. It should not be too anterior, otherwise you may injure the frontal branch, which is probably around here. So the lower you go, the more posterior you should be with the incision at the lower aspect. On the line, that connect both extremity of the incision. In fact, here, this line must pass uh, through uh, the body of the, max, of the maxilla, which make it uh, easier than for retraction. So you need to tailor the incision according to uh, the craniotomies that you want to do. Okay. It's important to keep the periostom covering the bone intact here. There is a thin layer of periostom in order to use it for closure of the dura at the end. Okay, here at some point, when I push the skin flap here, I uh, start to feel that I cannot push the skin anymore. Here. I cannot push the skin anymore. 
just need to adjust here the microscope. Should, oh. And it's time now to start the baisser la lumière un petit peu to start the interfacial dissection at this, at this point. Because if I keep going into this plan here, I will find uh, the frontal branch of the fascial nerve. So here I feel the area of the keyhole. So now it's time to start the interfacial dissection. Here, posteriorly, I have the limit of the temporalis muscle insertion. So I make an incision here along the superior temporal line. And here, I can identify just in this area, the two layers of the temporalis fascia. So if I hold here, the superficial fascia, I can see here both fascia, muscle fibers, deep fascia, superficial one, and I can cut here the superficial layer. And this is my interfacial dissection. The space I should not work in is this one. Because here, if I keep going here, I will meet the frontal branch. So I have to go deeper and cut here the superficial fascia. All the way down. I can meet some veins, but those veins can be coagulated quite uh, easily. They are deeper to the superficial fascia. And here now I cut the fat until I find the deep fascia. Here it is. This deep fascia is extremely important because when I follow it anteriorly, I can find the bone of the lateral margin, lateral rim of the orbit. I cut this vein. And here is the same. Okay, so this is interfacial dissection. Now I can retract my skin much more anteriorly. Okay. Here, I am going to retract here the periostom. Je trouve qu'il y a une brillance sur l'écran qui fait qu'on voit pas super bien. Okay, very important here to do a superiostal elevation in order to get to the superior orbital rim. Écartez-moi un peu. 
Non, allez-y. OK. Ici un peu. Voilà. And I start here to see. to see the orbital rim. And here, following the deep fascia, I get to the lateral rim of the orbit. Okay. We need some retraction. Okay. Okay, on va attendre ici. So down here down I can release the skin a little bit to get additional retraction of the skin anteriorly. And this is where I have to get close to the tragus. We can see here the tragus. I can feel here the zygoma. And I can make an incision here, quite posterior, until until I reach the zygoma. Which is here. If I am far posterior, I can cut a little bit more down and protect Prenez un fer à bœuf. Ici, m'écartez bien. Voilà. Okay. Most important it is to be as posterior as possible. Ciseau. Okay. Here also, I can keep going with following the deep fascia. There's always a tiny artery here. Paolo. We follow the deep fascia anteriorly. Suivez-moi. Okay, tirez bien. Here is a zygomatic arch, and I progressively expose here the body of the zygoma. And you see that the deep fascia really lead me on the body of the zygoma, 
lateral rim of the orbit and zygomatic arch. un peu plus comme ça, il faut tirer. Allez, c'est bien. We can help you with a sponge here, not to injure the soft tissue. Okay. Ok, vous pouvez relâcher un peu. Donnez-moi quelques compresses. I can gain a little bit more here. It will help for retraction of the skin. I am quite deep along the masseter muscle, which helps me to release the skin a little bit. Okay, now let's, let's work on the muscle. Working on the muscle is, uh, is extremely important to have a proper mobilization of the temporalis muscle in order to avoid uh, any injury to the muscle on, on post-operative Temporalis muscle atrophy. So I have all the limits of the muscle. I will make an incision all around. Here is the root of the zygoma. I can here identify the inferior limit of the muscle at the level of the posterior root of the zygomatic arch. And here I'm going to make an incision. You may leave a cuff of muscle. Depends on uh, your preferences. You see. Okay. And now, most important is to start the retrograde dissection of the temporalis muscle. So for this, for this, you need to identify here the periostom and cut the periostom. And then we should sharp instrument like this. Progressively, you elevate the periostom from inferior to superior. You want to keep this white layer of tissue here intact. No power in your instruments is mandatory. It's not something for which you need strength. But what I want to keep is this white layer. Dézoomer un peu. You see the vessels at the deep surface. And this is really what I want to keep intact.
So this movement is from down up. If you go reverse up down, you will not be able to keep this periostome. On the sharp angle instruments like this, it's perfect to do that. Here, it's a little bit more difficult because we are deeper below the muscle. So it's definitely an area where we should slow down with the dissection because here we are really at the origin of the vessels, near the origin of the vessels and nerve. So that's definitely where we absolutely want to keep it. I have to release here. Do you remember you? Okay. Always down up, even here. This movement of my instrument down up is, uh, is mandatory to keep this muscle intact. Here down, I release the muscle from the, from the zygomatic arch, down up also. I can use a sponge to release it a little bit more. I can say that the muscle is almost completely free and intact. So stitches, dézoomé, coupé court, celui-là. Voilà, on met une pince. I put two stitches in order to be able to mobilize the muscle anteriorly, posteriorly, depending on, uh, on the, the surface of bone I want to expose. Okay, here I expose anteriorly, here I expose posteriorly, periostom is, uh, is intact. So now we are getting ready to start the bony work. The bony work starts with uh, identification of the inferior orbital fissure. And for this, I need to get into the orbit and to elevate the periorbita from the superior orbital wall and uh, the lateral wall of the orbit. So to elevate the periorbita, I change my position in order to really face the patient and uh, to see the tip of my dissector into the orbit. So this is the part that is a little bit tricky. You need to anticipate it. Tire un petit peu plus fort. Voilà. Tire un peu plus fort. 
Voilà, tu vois. Ok. You really want to keep the periorbita intact. And for this, you take a little bit of time. It's a very important step because if you miss this step, you will have the periorbita in your way, your fat of the orbit in your way constantly. Il faudrait un aspirateur à un moment. Il faut un aspirateur. OK. Allez-y, tirez un peu plus fort. Voilà. So, I can really have some control of the tip of my instruments, which is most important to preserve the periorbita. Otherwise, it's difficult to keep the periorbita intact. And that's why I like to use a microscope for this step. Ouais. Il faut me le baisser un petit peu l'aspiration. Voilà. Là, il est presque éteint. OK. Very orbita is a little bit open anteriorly. But nothing. And progressively, I move along the lateral wall of the orbit towards the lateral aspect of the inferior orbital fissure. A smaller dissector is necessary here until I feel the defect of the inferior orbital fissure. Here, I just felt the defect. I'm going to try to show this defect. which is not always easy to see with the microscope because it's a, it's a little bit deep, but here is the defect of the lateral aspect of the inferior orbital fissure. And if I go on the other side, along the temporalis muscle, voilà. Pouvez m'écarter un petit peu là. Je vais monter un peu la table. Doucement avec le muscle. Ne le tirez pas trop fort. Je ne l'ai pas écarté. So here it's the same. Relâchez un peu. Voilà. I need to keep the periostome intact. I don't want to leave periostome on the bone. It's a, it's a place where you need to be careful because, again, this is a big trunk 
of vessel or nerve in this area. So if I move progressively here in the temporal fossa deep, I will get to the lateral aspect of the inferior orbital fissure. Écartez-moi un petit peu. I think the defect is here. If I place my dissector on the other side into the orbit, I should be able to see it. No, je vais juste mettre mon dissecteur là. To see the dissector here coming from the orbit into the temporal fossa. So this is an extremely important step because from here, I will put my B1 foot plate up here towards the orbital side of the McCarthy keel. And I will cut here through the lateral wall of the orbit. Okay. So now the first burr hole should be the McCarthy keyhole. In order to do the McCarthy keyhole, it's important to envision the position of the position of uh, the sphenoid ridge. You can feel here a kind of gutter. So this will be position of the sphenoid ridge. And this will be the limit of the frontal lobe. I, I can see here some bulging of the bone. So this should be the limit of the, of the frontal lobe and dura. So the best position for my McCarthy keyhole, in order to find it here, I put a dissector into the orbit. Voilà, vous me le tenez comme ça. So here, if I drill, I will find periorbita. If I drill, I will find dura. If I start my drilling here too low to get to the orbit, the distance to the frontal dura is, is quite long. So here is probably a good position for the McCarthy keyhole. So I first drill in the direction of So you need to make sure that the periorbita is protected. Voilà. Especially if you use a, a cutting burr like here. Another option is to use something uh, less aggressive, but if you have a good protection into the orbit, it's okay.
Okay. So here is a, is a periorbital exposed. And now I change my position to go towards towards the frontal dura. How was it? Okay, so your drill should be perpendicular to the dura, especially if you use a cutting burr, because this is the safest part. Mettez pas votre main devant le... The safest part of the drill is the tip of the drill. And Lateral aspect of the drill is extremely aggressive, but if you drill like this, it's okay. It's less aggressive. It's still dangerous, but less aggressive. So now I have this bridge of bone between uh, frontal dura and, uh, and the orbit that I can progressively increase in size. Using a carry sun ranger here is a, is a good option to make it bigger. The dura seems very thin here. So if I want to keep it intact, I need to be quite careful. It would be probably tough to keep it completely intact. Yes, the dura is, uh, is very thin and is a little bit open here. Okay. So here I really have the McCarthy keyhole with, uh, here I am into the orbit. And I can thin it, this bridge of bone, arrosé un petit peu pour qu'on voit. Arrosé bien. Enlever la sueur d'os. Cannot find the dura here on this side. Okay. Arrosé à fond. Voilà. OK. So, McCarthy Keyhole is done. Inferior orbital fissure is done. 
I should do two additional burr hole. So I will do now a burr hole on the temporal area. Arrosé, le pas d'eau. Ok, un additional burr hole here in the frontal area. Enlever le, le truc. Now we have to elevate the dura from the outer inner uh, cortical uh, bone. It's not necessarily very easy in this case because I have the feeling that the dura is extremely thin and fragile, which uh, happen quite frequently with the age. It's important to preserve the dura matter intact, especially for extra dual approach. Now we will start with the with the bone cut. The burr hole are are done. First bone cut to be done is the one on the zygomatic arch. So we need to cut the zygoma. So here, tirer un peu plus, Lorenzo. We need to expose the posterior aspect of the zygoma and to detach a little bit the masseter muscle fibers. Okay. And we can start to do the first bone cut here, placing the B1 foot plate here, and oblique cut posteriorly.
Okay. So the first bone cut is done over the zygoma. Second bone cut to be done is the one from the inferior orbital fissure to the orbital aspect of the McCarthy keyhole. This is probably the most difficult one to do because you need to identify the inferior orbital fissure, which is not necessarily very easy. And in order to do this bone cut, you absolutely need to protect carefully the periorbita. Respirateur. Écarté avec le phare à bœuf. Merci. Prenez des... Me, faut tenir ça comme ça. Okay. Someone need to protect the superior beta. Tenez le bien. And uh, now I need to place the B1 foot plate here through the superior beta through the inferior orbital fissure, sorry, here, this way. You just check that the dissector is protecting the periorbita, like this. And then I can directly cut towards the orbital aspect. I have cut the lateral aspect of the orbit. Now, we will do the cut over the body of the zygoma. It's a difficult cut because you need significant amount of uh, retraction. And if your incision at the beginning, do not consider this retraction, then it can be very difficult to expose this part of the maxilla. And you need to expose it if you want to cut it. So you need at least one centimeter of exposure. Not more than this, otherwise, if you cut more than one centimeter from the angle here between frontal process of the zygoma and zygomatic arch, you may enter at some point into the maxillary sinus. Okay, so from here to here, one centimeter is a good distance, not more than this. If it's too short, this will break at some point.
okay? On the final part of the cut, can be made with the chisel. On a le marteau qui va avec. Okay. And I just saw it moving. So it means that I reach the inferior orbital fissure. So this part of the cut is done. And now I have to do the craniotomy, joining all the burr hole together. Okay, the only thing here that will be difficult, I think, is to preserve the dura matter. And I have to finish here lateral to the supraorbital nerve, which is, I believe, in this area. Here is a notch, here must be the nerve. So I want to finish lateral to this, uh, med, uh, lateral to this, yeah, not, uh, okay. Let's see. So this is the part I believe where it will be difficult to preserve the dura matter. And here, entirely, I really need to go as low as possible. On the orbital rim. And then I go reverse. Protecting here also my periorbita. I go reverse here with the B1 foot plate. Arrosé pour bien nettoyer la sciure d'os. Arrosé voir. C'est bon. I go reverse. Now I have to go in the temporal area and work on my the inferior aspect of the craniotomy. And here also I need to do my final final cut here of the orbital roof. Unfortunately, I don't have a small chisel. 
Unfortunately, there was a break here, which can happen sometimes. Okay. And now I will drill here the last part. Okay, so now we have to release completely the bone flap. This is a little bit difficult to slowly release everything. I need to release here the insertion of the masseter muscle, écarté un peu plus, okay only the posterior aspect of it. Cartella. Okay. The final part is, uh, is a little bit tricky. Last attachment here. Here is the final aspect of, uh, of the bone flap. Okay. So the dura was a little bit disrupted here, but that's okay. I, I thought it would be worse. In compress. You can see that we can retract the temporalis muscle quite low here. And this is the goal of this approach, is to really retract the muscle very low. So now we can start with uh, the extradural work. What we want to remove now is this uh, pyramid of bone made by the greater and lesser sphenoid ridge. So we peel the dura matter away from the superior wall of the orbit here, from the super aspect of the sphenoid ridge. The sphenoid ridge is here. We can remove this piece of bone with a ranger and then start to drill progressively 
the lesser sphenoid ridge and greater sphenoid ridge to isolate the superorbital fissure. un petit peu le muscle en bas avec un rosé ici là plus en avant doucement avec le muscle doucement avec les mouvements ok arrosé arrosé à fond arrosé Arrosé. Il me faut une diamante écorcée maintenant. Ok. We're getting closer to the inferior orbital fissure. To the superorbital fissure, sorry. Ouais. Ouais, je vais prendre la corset. And now we can drill downward to completely open the inferior orbital fissure. We have a very nice access to the lower aspect here of the temporal fossa. And we can even slide on the lateral plate of the pterygoid process, being superiostal. And this is one of the great advantages of this approach. This is already the insertion of the lateral pterygoid muscle here. And here, keeping the periostome intact, we can feel the lateral pterygoid plate here. Awesome. Ok. Baissez un peu l'aspirateur de nouveau.
Okay. So we have opened the, inferior, the super orbital fissure. Completely. Okay. And now we can start to elevate the lateral, uh, the dura from the most anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus, cutting the orbitotemporal periostal fold in order to increase the exposure of the clinoid process. Il va me falloir, je pense, des écarteurs parce que le baisser un petit peu l'aspirateur. Voilà, C'est bon, vous pouvez enlever votre machin. Baisser un peu l'aspi. So I am elevating now the dura from the temporal fossa floor. Il me faut du fil un peu plus fin. This is middle meningeal artery. pour enlever la sueur d'os. Okay, this, this piece of bone here to flatten my craniotomy downward can be easily removed or drilled. But because we are a little bit in a hurry, I'm not going to do it right now. If I keep peeling here in this direction, I will find progressively V2. Vous baissez un petit peu l'aspi. This is most likely V2 here. Okay. Là, il est éteint. Voilà, parfait. And here, is the orbital temporal periostal fold. Here. <coughs> Le bistouri. Et les ciseaux micro -chiens. So in order to start the peeling of the dura, there is two options. We can either start here at the level of the orbital temporal periostal fold, or we can start here at the level of uh, V2. In both foramina, SOF or foramen rotundum, there is a bridge of periostom. Let's start here. So I just make an incision of the last of the lateral aspect of the inferior orbit, superorbital fissure. Nothing cross this part of the inferior orbit, the superorbital fissure except the orbitomeningeal artery. And then I can peel progressively the dura matter from the most anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus ciseaux micro shear and expose it
Nu kopa. Nu kopa. So I can keep this peeling as far back as I want. What I see here is a super ophthalmic vein. This could be V1 here. Difficult to say. And here I am peeling the dura from Still, super orbital fissure. V2 is a little bit lower. This must be V2 here. V2 entering in ciseau micro, entering in uh, Est-ce que je peux avoir une autre paire de ciseaux droits si on en a une autre En micro, oui. Est-ce que ça coupe pas So this is a cleavage plane between the dura and the inner layer of uh, the cavernous sinus. So if I am dealing here with a cavernous sinus meningioma, for example, doing this, I separate the cavernous sinus part of the meningioma from the intradural part of the meningioma. And you can also see that I increase the exposure of the anterior clinoid process significantly. I can see here my anterior clinoid process. So if I am dealing with a cavernous sinus meningioma and I have to do an anterior clinoidectomy for this, it's better to peel the dura matter from the cavernous sinus first and then to do the clinoidectomy. Il me faut une fraise diamantée longue. De trois. The brain is a little bit stiff here, so it will not necessarily be easy to do the clinoidectomy in this situation. This is already the entry point of optic nerve into the optic canal. I can see falciform ligament here. So exposing the clinoid process like this make it much safer, much easier. Okay, let's try to retract the dura matter a little bit for the clinoidectomy. You need a little bit of, uh, of retraction, not necessarily a lot, but you need a little bit of retraction. So the brain here is, uh, is very stiff, so difficult to put a retractor. So you can see here V1. This is probably the fourth nerve here. And this is most likely third here, between here and here. So 
So, la pince à os. So I can get a little bit more exposure of the base of the clinoid process here because I have done an orbitotomy. And I can quite easily feel the end of uh, the optic canal. Removing this piece of bone will give me additional exposure. To perform the clinoidectomy. Okay. Arroser un peu. Okay. So the clinoidectomy, you should start in the base of the clinoid process. To get into the volume of the clinoid. I cross suction and drill to protect Okay, here is a cancellous bone of the clinoid process, and I want to enlarge the base to really a being able to empty the clinoid process from this cancellous bone. From the center to the periphery of the clinoid. If I am in the cancellous bone, I am quite safe. Whenever I have cortical bone, I slow down and I am more careful. I want to look now for the optic canal. Okay. 
I feel that the optic canal is around here. Navigation. This is the optic canal. Irriguez bien. OK. The optic canal now is uh, Voilà, donnez-moi la 3 de nouveau. La trois diamantée. So now that my structure I exposed and the, the base of the clinoid is big enough, I am uh, moving back to the third, to the, the three uh, diamond. The biggest is the diamond, the safest it is. A uh, two diamond is more dangerous and more difficult to control. Okay, you can see here is the exit zone of the of the optic canal. Est-ce que j'ai un suceur plus petit en diamètre Okay, I'm taking a smaller section. No, it's on the same diameter. Okay, la fraise. When you do that, you need a constant irrigation. One of the biggest danger for the optic nerve is heat. Every time the bone change color and became yellow, become yellow, it means that the heat is very high. Under constant irrigation.
I am drilling now on the lateral aspect of the optic canal towards the inferior surface of the clinoid. Inferior surface of the clinoid is, uh, you need to be careful because just below it, you have the third nerve. Here is uh, the optic strut, which is the inferior root of the canoid process. I see the venous plexuses deep that are probably around the carotid artery. And I have the feeling that this is a pneumatization of the optic strut here. I have the feeling that this is mucosa of the sphenoid sinus, which is uh, nice to see here. It means that there is a significant opticocarotid recess if we go on the nasal. So this is mucosa, arose. So here is uh, the optic canal with the last shell of bone over the optic nerve. This is here inferior aspect of the clinoid process. I know it is here. We need to free the clinoid here from the optic strut, I believe, right there. And the clinoid process should be free. The tip. So it's not always necessary to remove the tip of the clinoid. You remove it if it's in your way. If it's not, there's not necessarily a need to take it out. Okay, tip of the clinoid is, uh, is broken. If the tip is not moving properly, it can mean that there is uh, carotidoclinoid foramen, which means a ring around the carotid artery, which could be the case here, because I have the feeling that there is a tiny attachment still uh, at the tip of the clinoid. So in this case, you have to be very careful taking the tip out.
tout petit peu moins de flotte. There is usually a So once the tip of the clinoid is well mobilized, you should not track on it huh, to take it out because again, there is a, sometimes a spine of bone behind the carotid. So you should free it progressively from its dural attachment. And it should come out by itself without too much uh, traction on it. It's better to do it this way than taking it out. Uh, Est-ce qu'on a une petite pince? I have no small instruments to take it out, so I'm going to use this. She's a little bit big, but... Okay. The tip of the clinoid is out. So here is probably the venous plexus is around the carotid artery. And with a little bit more I took the venous plexuses in my drill, and here is a carotid artery. In Kerison toute fine. Okay. So, a few minutes to expose more the cavernous sinus. Okay. So, optic canal here. Clinoidal segment, optic strut. As I said before, I think that this is here pneumatization of the optic strut. I'm sure I can put yes. Here I am into the sphenoid sinus. So this is mucosa of the sphenoid sinus. So it's something, if, if this happened during surgery, I absolutely need to close it with bone wax and also a piece of tissue, pericranium, for example. So here is the cavernous sinus with the third nerve here. This is V1 on force, force V1, V2, venous plexuses, venous channel of the cavernous sinus. If I keep going downward here, I see V2. And I, if I keep going backward, I will expose V3. This is the beginning of V3 here on Framen Valley. When you do that, you have always to remember that there is brain behind the dura. So retraction should be careful. Here, the brain is very stiff, but gentle movement. This is V3. This is middle meningeal artery and spinosum. So we have the full cavernous sinus. With here, we start to see Meckel's cave. 
deep here. This is Meckel's cave. We can see that there is some fluid. This is a micro shear. I think we could do a slight opening of Meckel's cave here. This is Meckel's cave on the fibers of cisternal segments of V3, uh, of uh, three geminal nerve, sorry. Okay. Parfait, parfait. Three geminal ganglion. We can open more a little bit the common sinus. And I can look for the sixth nerve, which is deeper into the cavernous sinus. This carotid artery here. Baissez un peu l'aspirateur. La, Est-ce que j'ai une petite euh, pince à disque fine? This is six nerve here, right there. Okay. This is a thick nerve here, lateral, running lateral to the carotid artery. And this is the end of Dorello's canal. I have here, montez un peu l'aspirateur. I have here Dorello's canal on the six nerve. Okay. Okay. We can take a little bit out the venous plexuses. And here So we clearly identify carotid artery, third ner uh, fourth nerve here. The third nerve is right there. We can open slightly the oculomotor cistern to see third better. Here is third going into the oculomotor cistern. And you can see cisternal segment of third. It's not something we do this way during surgery, but you can see entering third, entering the cistern. Deep here, 
is the mesial temporal lobe. And this is either PCA or SCA. I believe it's SCA running below third. Let's open rapidly CISO. Pincette, just la pincette, a griff. Let's open rapidly the Dura for you to see. Uh, for you to have an idea of uh, Bisturi. Voilà. The brain is very stiff, so I'm not completely sure we will be able to see much. Okay. Just remove a little bit of Dura to be able to see better. So carotid artery, distal dural ring. Carotid artery, A A1 segment. A1 segment here. We have third nerve going into carotid, the oculomotor cistern. Okay. I can open here the ring. of the oculomotor foramen. Here it is. On voit bien là l'écran. So oculomotor foramen with third going into the cavernous sinus. You can see that once I have open oculomotor foramen, I can mobilize third to gain space, to have an access lateral to third here. Okay, this is the brain stem here with PCA above the third nerve, SCA below, PCA, SCA. Anterior choroidal is probably here. So we have uh, almost everything here, the fourth nerve, the third, V1, carotid artery into the cavernous sinus. Uh, this is a posterior ascending segment of the carotid artery. We have the sixth nerve. We have V1 and V2, V1, V2. 
we have here the carotid artery and also the I just recut the distal dural ring, which is difficult part of the ring of the carotid artery to, to expose because the ring is uh, continuous with the adventitia of the vessel. So you have to be careful. We have optic nerve. I'm looking for ophthalmic artery. It is probably a little bit more anterior. Sometimes ophthalmic artery originate in the subarachnoid space, sometimes subdural, sometimes extradural. It's probably a very anterior origin of the ophthalmic artery, optic nerve here. And deep here is a stalk, pituitary stalk seen between carotid artery and, uh, and the optic nerve. This is the stalk. And this is, I guess, PICOM here. And I can see the basilar very deep here. I don't have much space, but this is basilar artery. Superior hypophysal artery here. And this is PCA and PICOM. PCA and PICOM, and here are the perforators. On the other side here, perforators, PCA. This is probably anterior choroidal. Okay. Final view of this FTOZ approach. Okay. Let's uh, let's stop now and move to the session where we will discuss cases with uh, Masahiro Chin from Tokyo. I think he's ready to, to, yeah. to start. And, hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Masahiro? Oui. Comment ça va? Ça va, va? Oui. Ça va bien. <laughs> Je vais descendre en bas, mais uh, <laughs> Paolo, Paolo will start to present the case. We would like okay. to discuss with you, okay? Okay, yes. Hello. So, Paolo, start to, to present the case. And then, uh, Masahiro, we would like you to, to, give, you, to give us your, your insight, your strategy about uh, how to treat this case. We, we already uh, treated this uh, patient. But mm -hmm. we would like to have your opinion on it. What would be your strategy? Because uh, you're extremely experienced with uh, this type of pathology, this type of uh, tumor. Masai Rochin is one of the leader, uh, world leader in skull-based surgery, and spe specifically for this uh, pathology. Go ahead, okay. Uh, Paolo. OK. So good morning again. So nice to meet you, Professor Shin. Um, yep. So I will start to, this, uh, to discuss this case. The first session uh, of this morning is ended. We saw uh, the, the dissection of uh, OZ, anterior carnidectomy, and exposure of the cavernous sinus. Uh, so we actually we sent uh, this uh, this case to Professor Shin uh, last week. Uh, we, as uh, Frolich said, we already treated the patient and uh, we are uh, very curious to understand uh, if we made some mistakes or if we could do something better for the, for the patient. So I will start to present the, the case and then I will stop just before showing uh, uh, what was our treatment. Uh, so we will see like uh, yesterday uh, the, um, the discussion of uh, Professor Shin, and then I will show uh, what was our uh, uh, decision for this uh, patient. So um, uh, no, it's, um, this was a young lady, uh, 35 years old. Uh, she presented to us uh, for uh, uh, just very mild symptom because she had only a uh, transient diplopia, uh, mainly um, derived for a palsy of four cranial nerve, and she had no other neurological symptoms, nothing. 
So this is the MRI that uh, she showed to us. So uh, as you can see, this is uh, really a, a huge tumor. Um, I will go briefly to the, into the characteristic of this lesion. So it's uh, the, um, apparently uh, both an extradural and intradural extension with an invasion uh, with an extension mostly laterally on the left side, but also on the right side, as you can see here, very close to the internal acoustic meatus on the, on the right side, and uh, an invasion of the cavernous sinus uh, on the left side. Intradural portion is very clear here, very uh, adherent uh, apparently to the brainstem. So you can see the long axis of the tumor actually is uh, from the right inferior part going anteriorly on the left side. So it's, uh, it's a huge lesion and uh, we questioned us how to treat this. Uh, as you can see here, there is uh, the invasion of the, um, there is an adherence maybe with the um, cerebellar peduncle on the right side, but as a huge lateral extension on the left side uh, in the mechal scale and the cavernous sinus. Uh, the last images uh, important to, to, to look at is always the CT scan for this kind of lesion. Uh, you can see the petrous suffix on the left side is uh, involved. We have a, a erosion on the left side of the, the petrous apex, very close to the carotid. You can see the ICA um, the, close to the relos canal, and you can see there is also some uh, uh, hyperostotic portion of the tumor with the, some intra lesion calcification. The clivus is eroded, as you can see here in the sagittal uh, um, images, uh, and also the base here of the middle fossa is uh, eroded. So uh, what we asked to uh, Professor Shin and uh, the beginning, what we asked to ourselves was uh, which are the treatment options for this case uh, and uh, which are the, the surgical strategies that we should adopt in this case. And uh, in the case of, uh, of surgery, which are the goals of, uh, of surgery for this case? Uh, the, the consideration that we, we, we've done are uh, mainly, this is uh, not only a purely extradural tumor, but as a huge extra intradural extension, maybe the same sides. Uh, the left ICA is involved inside the cavernous sinus and close to the, to the, the petrous apex. The patient is uh, mainly um, uh, almost intact on uh, at level, neurological level with no major um, neurological symptoms uh, except for uh, transient dipopia. And the patient is a young patient, 35 years old. So we uh, questioned us also on the histological hypothesis of this, uh, of this uh, lesion, the tumor. Uh, should it be a chordoma, maybe a chondrosarcoma, or that were the two um, most uh, relevant hypotheses. And also, well, I put this just like to increase the, the suspense, uh, pedermoid cyst and meningioma. So um, I will, uh, how would you proceed in this case? This is what we asked to Professor uh, Shin. Uh, we will should we start with the biopsy to have an idea of oh, this is the histology? So this, this will change our strategy in terms of resection uh, or should we go directly for a resection? In this case, should it be a, directly an endoscopic approach, a purely endoscopic, or we need a, a combination of endoscopic and transcranial procedure. And also we, we asked about the goals of surgery in terms of resection, preservation of function, because she's, I want to repeat again, a young lady with no major uh, symptoms. So now I stop and I ask Professor Shin to, to present his uh, discussion of the case and uh, his suggestion for this patient. Yes, I Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can, I Can you see me? Time? Yes, of course. Okay, it's nice to see you. Thank you very much for being uh, being with us. It's uh, it's very nice to to have you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure, and thank you very much for inviting this uh, honorable um, web meeting, web conference. Thank you very much. What time is it now in uh, in Tokyo? Now it's uh, about six thirty p.m. in afternoon. Okay, then, almost the yeah. end. Almost the end of your day now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so so go ahead with your with your presentation and the 
opinion about this this case and then uh, if you can if you can tell us more about your experience with this type of uh, of tumor okay so um i think this is a very young woman and also she didn't have any neurological symptom but the the region is quite big big enough and compressing many cranial nerves and brain stem. So at least we have to remove it. And when we think about surgical strategy, maybe we should think about the worst pathology, which is maybe the, the chordoma is the worst pathology for her. So when we construct the strategy, I think we should uh, consider the strategy for the skull base cordon. And so I think the diagnosis may be a cordoma and maybe chondrosarcoma. The problem is the, the tumor is invading in the cavernous sinus and also the cribus and penetrating the cribus to the prefrontal system and severely compressing the brainstem. And also it's going to a little bit lateral to Cryo region. And uh, maybe the Sebastian did not expect me to do the transcranial approach. So I think about how I can do it with the trans endoscopically with transphenoidal way. So in my university, there are uh, many cordoma cases and condorsal comas, but this is uh, one of the largest tumor, in, even in my experience. But in our strategy, the first we recommend the maximum surgical resection, and especially for the aiming for the total resection. And also if the tumor is strongly adherent to the cranial nerve or brainstem, maybe we remove it and very thin layer with very residual thin layer. And after that, we prescribe the high dose radio surgery. So in this case, so we first recommend her to do the, the, the maximum resection. But how, in which way? Is the endoscopic transnasal approach is, is uh, the feasible or not? So first of all, I just uh, introduce our approach method. This is our endoscopic transnasal approach. So we usually use the nasal spectra, but we put the nasal spectra in each nostril. We just inside the septum mucosa here and dissect it submucosally. Like this, we just put only small incision on the, the nasal spectrum, uh, septum mucosa, and then dissect it to the vomer bone. And another side, we put, we made the same incision here and dissect the mucosa, the mucosa into the vomer bone. And then the septal bone is temporarily removed and we put the nasal spectra like this in each spectral blade is inserted in each nostril And like this, we can keep wide surgical field without sacrifice of nasal turbinate and nasal septum. Then we can perform the wide exposure of the sphenoid sinus. And after surgery, we just remove the nasal spectra and then we return the septal mucosa. This is the right nostril and we put the balloon to compress the, the materials in a the scurvy reconstruction and then we return the septal bone here like this. And after surgery, this three picture is one is a pre-operative pre image and 
another one is uh, three months later and after surgery, and one is one year after surgery. So it looks like almost the same. So you can see that, that there is no sacrifice of nasal component in our surgical method. And in our method, we just do surgery by one surgeon and one scrub nurse. And we use uh, the stealth navigation and Mitaka holder and also a cranial nerve monitoring. And also we use uh, various curved malleable devices like bipolar also malleable and link red and various dissectors and scissors are also malleable. And we usually use this curve, a transnasal valve medotronic midas rex. So when I think about this case, the first, we start with the transcavernous approach like this. So endoscopic cavernous sinus approach. We, I start with the trans endoscopic cavernous sinus approach. When we see this software, the cavernous sinus is located in lateral of the spinal sinus. So we just remove the esmoid sinus and septums and we just attract the middle turbinate laterally. Then we go into the spinal sinus and the cellar is here and cavernous sinus is located here lateral of the spinal sinus like this. So when we go into the cavernous sinus, your incision is here like this or inside. So lateral incision is mainly for the meningeum and trigeminal schwannel. And medial as, uh, inc incision is for chordoma and the chondral sarcoma. So in this case, we use a medial incision like this. And we first go into the cavernous signs from inside. So usually the cranial nerves are located the lateral to the cavernous sinus. So we can directly see the we can see the cranial nerve at the end of the resection. I will show you a case. This is a recurrent chordoma case. So I drilling off the sphenoid floor and also cellar floor and bony remover was extended to the lateral. So bony structure on the cavernous sinus also drilled off and when we treat the skull base chordoma, we routinely remove the dorsum cellar bone also. And first we expose the dura mater on the carotid prominence. And we can see the We can see the 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 barge, barge of the dural attachment here. So we start opening the dural matter here. You can clearly see the internal carotid artery here. So there is a tumor around here. So we start dural incision, and you can find the tumor here. And usually the scalvis cordoma is easily dissected from the internal carotid artery. Then we gradually proceed the tumor dissection here. In, and then we switch it to the 30 degree endoscope and we can see the lateral membrane of cavernous sinus here. There is a, maybe these components are the, the trigeminal nerve or something. Then going to the intracranial space too. So this tumor is extending into the, the intradural space. So we have to remove this with the dura mater. So we open the dura mater and start dissection continued dissection 
of the tumor. And remove the tumor piece by piece. And the two, this is the, the, the vector line tumor and it's strongly other length to the arachnoid, but usually the, the recurrent chordoma is strongly other linked to an arachnoid and the pier matter. In this case, the sixth nerve is involved in the, the cranial nerve, but her cranial nerve function, sixth nerve function is already lost for long years. So we remove the tumor dissecting from the PR matter. Using the QSER. And the small residual lesion is also dissected from the brainstem. I think it's okay if we dissect from the pier matter, it never injures the corticospinal tract. In, in this case, we, can achieve, we could achieve the total dissection and she didn't have any neurological complication, but her abducing the palsy didn't improve. And I show another case. This case is a young male patient with chondral sarcoma. In this case, the tumor is rather soft, so we open the dura matter here, then expose the tumor here. And most of the tumor was very soft, but there is a calcified part here. So in chondral sarcoma case, we have to be very careful because sometimes those calcification is very sharp. And if we put it in, in, in the internal carotid artery, it can cause uh, damage the internal carotid artery. But in this case, we could achieve the total detection and under 30 degree endoscope, we can see the sixth nerve here and the trigeminal nerve here. So after surgery, he have complete remove Im improvement of his cranial nerve symptoms. So in this case, I think for the cavernous part, Maybe this one, this case is uh, the virgin case. So maybe the tumor can be uh, easily dissected from the, the cranial nerve. So we should at attempt the, the transcavernous approach. And then for the cryber part, we should try the transcranial cryber approach. So cryber recess is located in in between the, the carotid prominence and below the, the serratorchia. So we open this part here. And when we go into the, the, the cryo recess, we should drain off not only the approach route, but we have to extensively remove the bony margin because the, the chordoma always invading into the bony structure and when they relapse, they always relapse from the bony margin. So we recommend to drill off all the cryvis and also dorsum cella. And when we remove the dorsum cella, it often bleed. There is massive bleeding from the, the, bit, the vaginal plexus, but it's easily stopped with the, the fossil. So we can directly see the we can evidently see the, the carotid prominence here. So we can drill off all the cribus and dorsum cella form. And also when the tumor is extended to the, the lower part, I look meant to drill off the jugular velcum and also the medial half of occipital condyle. In this case, we remove the, the this one is uh, I'm drilling off the Jagrat on the left side and right side. 
to prevent the, the recurrence like this. The problem is uh, the when the tumor is strongly adherent to the brainstem. But I think I recommend to try attempt the, the tumor removal from the when when the, the tumor didn't strongly adherent to the, the vaginal artery because the tumor is often strongly adherent to the, the pia matter, but we can dissect it piece by piece like this. So we should attempt the, the removal if the tumor is easily, dissect, if tumor is uh, dissectable from the vaginal artery. But sometimes it is like this, the tumor is strong, a stone hard, and it's involving the vaginal artery. In this case, we should not try the dissection from the vaginal artery. So in this case, we split the tumor and remove the tumor block by block. But in this situation, we have to be very careful not to disseminate the, the tumor cells. So we recommend the block by block resection and also, if there is a residual tumor like this, I think we should cover the residual tumor with non-absorbable material like the first year or something like that. Because if we expose, leave the tumor in here, maybe it can be a dissemination. It, it can cause a dissemination. So we should cover it. And I think it's quite effective to prevent the dissemination. So this is a recurrent condor sarcoma in the te same technique. We should, first we do the, the mass reduction, then we dissect the tumor from lateral to medial, like this. and piece by piece of resection, and we can effectively remove the tumor. Was that brainstem damage? Like this. I think this is most similar case of this patient, of course, in Japan, we don't have much large cases. The, the tumor is often very modest, but it's invading into the basal system like this. And in this case, I perform the same procedure. The septal dissection and using the specula like this. wide exposure of sphenoid sinus. The first we remove the, the tumor component in the sphenoid sinus. Piece by piece resection. Then we go into the intradural space. We drilling of the cribal recess. And trying the removal of the dorsum cellar. The tumor stump is exposed here. Then we change the scope to the 30 degree and we looking up the dorsum cellar and there, there is a residual bony component here.
Then we start the mass reduction. Like this, and after sufficient mass reduction, we start to remove the tumor capsule. We start dissection from the brain stem. And in this case, the tumor capsule was easily dis dissectable from the brain stem. And in Cordoma case, the tumor is often dissectable from the arterial component. So we dissect the tumor from the basilar artery. The cordoma is often attached to the pia mater or uh, arachnoid, but it usually do not Embed into the vascular wall. So we remove the tumor from the third nerve and superior cerebellar artery. And then there is a small residual tumor. So we remove it. And after that, we observe here there is a mammillary body here and vascular artery and PCA, posterior cerebellar artery, and the posterior communicating artery, bilateral, and ocular motor nerve here. And total removal performed, and we made a reconstruction here. The, and in this case, we achieved total resection, and his symptom also improved in the in three months. So, when we consider how to treat the lateral part here, the petrocribal region, there is a tumor very close to the, the internal auditory canal. I think the, we recommend the anterior trans endoscopic anterior petrocell approach. So again, we see it on the software. So there is an internal carotid artery in the lateral side of the spinal sinus. And there is a small space behind the internal carotid artery here. There is a lower cranial nerve here. And far from here, there is a, a facial nerve and acoustic nerve. So we use this triangle. And Drilling of the cribus, this line, and also floor of the spinal sinus, and also medial side of the internal carotid artery, then we can expose the petrocephalic tumor. And also, if we remove all petrocephalic, we can directly see the this one is the anterior side, posterior side, and trigeminal nerve indentation, and internal carotid artery here, and uh, internal auditory mutus here, and uh, the jagra bulb here, and this one is hypoglossarchum. So in such case, this one is a chondrosarcoma case. After tumor removal, we can clearly see the facial nerve and the acoustic nerve here and petrous vein here and trigeminal nerve here. I think in this way, we can reach the CP angle, the cerebral pontine angle, but maybe it's difficult to reach the internal auditory meatus but we can remove the tumor in the cerebral pontine angle and the cerebral medullary angle. So this one is uh, the recurrent meningioma case. I operated yesterday, and this one involves the bilateral petrocribal region. She had a mild facial palsy and truncal attack here. And after that, I remove the, the, most of the, the part like this, but 
the, in this case, the tumor was strongly adherent to the, the abducens nerve in the Dorello can, canal and also internal auditory meatus. So I remove it, but I, it, I achieved the partial resection, but sufficient removal were achieved. So I think in this case too, we recommend the endoscopic removal. However, the problem is how to reconstruct the, the skull base defect. We usually do not use the nasoceptal flap because it's also, it's had a, a problem about the, the olfaction and also the patient discomfort is not negligible. So we usually use the multi-layer fascia closure. First, we use arachnoid plasty with gel home and inlay and outlay fascia closure and sinus balloon compression and spinal drainage for three days. For example, for there is a big defect like this. So first we put the gel form and then we put the inlay first year and onlay first year. And the white puts the fat dish and then those materials are complex, compressed by the sinus bone. And after surgery, we ask the anesthesiologist to avoid the too much stress, too much strain to have extubation. So when we consider this case, for me, I recommend the endoscopic transnasal approach, which means endoscopic transsustenoidal, transcavernous, transcribus, transpetrosal approach. And I believe that with this approach method, combination of those endoscopic technique, we can achieve the total resection with bony margin. And I believe that we can create such total resection. Thank you very much. The experience that you have with uh with Cordoma in general and, uh, and with endoscopic and the nasal approach. Um, yeah. Definitely your technique is, uh, is very nice. I like it a lot because it's a very conservative technique for the endonasal structures. And uh, we have a little bit of the same uh, philosophy, which means we are trying to reduce uh, the morbidity, the endonasal morbidity by reducing uh, the size of the approach. We are not submucosal like you are, we are, mm -hmm. but we are mononostril in the vast majority of cases uh, using this uh, chopsticks technique uh, that mm -hmm. we have published. But uh, I, I like this concept of being uh, uh, submucosal on both sides like this, you're completely outside of the nasal cavity. And yeah. I have the feeling that it's, it could be one of the major reasons why you have such a low rate of CSF leak because yeah. in fact you are submucosal and at the end of the surgery you plug the sphenoid sinus with fat uh, mm -hmm. or something and uh, this is something that we are doing now with an incision on the rostrum and then we, we close the mucosa of the rostrum just like we, we would close the skin with an open approach and I think we have a little bit of the same uh, concept uh, of, of approach, and this is maybe a good way to reduce uh, CSF leak. Yeah. Now I have a few questions uh, to ask you about uh, the case, because yeah. yes, as you expect, we had a different strategy, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this is why it's nice to discuss, uh, to yeah. discuss deeply uh, about uh, this uh, specific case. Mm -hmm. So. My concern with uh, this specific uh, situation was first, uh, there was a, 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 maybe we could uh, show the, uh, keep the view of uh, Masahiro. Yeah. Uh, first, it was to, that there was a, a significant intradural extension of this cordoma. 
And yes. on the right side, it was going up to the level of, uh, of seven on eight with a little mm -hmm. bit of mass effect of the cisternal segment of uh, seven on eight. Yes. Secondly, uh, there was a, an important superior extension uh, here, uh, pushing third, especially on the right side, but also on the left, pushing third significantly uh, superiorly. So my fear going endoscopic on the nasally was not to have sufficient control of third to keep third, because if you have a third postoperatively, if you have a complete third, it's like losing the eye. So yeah. my concern was pr nerve preservation, especially third uh, on the super aspect of the tumor. If you look at the coronal slide, third, in fact, is pushed superiorly on the top of this piece of tumor here. And we yeah. could see it on the Fiesta sequences. We could see that it was completely stretched. And yeah. my second concern was uh, the seventh nerve more laterally uh, on the right side. Mm -hmm. in, order, in order to, to achieve a good control of those cranial nerves, you need a wide intradural exposure on the nasally. So you need to do a wide opening of the dura mater. But the wider is the opening of the dura mater, the more difficult it is also to close. This was my, my concern. Yeah. Uh, so this is about the, the surgical strategy. And this is why we use the combination of endoscopic endonasal approach to take the cavernous sinus part of the tumor, everything here that was inside the cavernous sinus, stopping here about at this line. I don't know if you see my, uh, no. we don't no. see it on the, okay. on the screen. But uh, uh, stopping at the, at, the, at the border between intradural and extradural. And then mm -hmm. we did a posterior petrosal approach uh, mm -hmm. from the combined petrosal approach from the right side uh, mm -hmm. to resect the intradural part of the tumor and to have a, a better cranial nerve control to make sure that there would not be in uh, postoperatively a third or a seven on eight or a six nerve palsy because she was completely intact. Yeah. So I will show you the, the video of it, but yeah. your, your argument is uh, are, are absolutely good because you, I mean, you have first the technique and mm -hmm. uh, of this different access of the skull yeah. base on the nasally. And mm -hmm. secondly, uh, you have uh, this uh, strategy for closure, which I believe is, uh, is very nice. Here, okay. you can see here the superior aspect of the tumor on the right, uh, yeah. indicating that there was probably a tight relationship between the tumor, the PCOM, uh, mm -hmm. third nerve, PCA, mm -hmm. uh, and, and eventually some perforator. So this was yeah. my, my, the thing I was worried about. The second uh, question I wanted to ask you, uh, you are not considering a biopsy in a case like this first. The, the I, I raise this question because the differential diagnosis in this case yeah. was uh, chondrosarcoma. Yeah. It's not very calcified. It's not very calcified for a chondrosarcoma. Yeah. We would expect yeah. more calcification. But yeah. if you look at the CT scan here, you see that there is erosion of the bone here in the yeah. area of the, of the suture between petrous mm -hmm. bone and sphenoid. And this yeah. is the area where chondrosarcoma arises. So yeah. my concern was maybe it could be a chondrosarcoma. There was more chance mm -hmm. for this tumor to be a chordoma, yeah. but the strategy would have changed in my hands if it was a okay. chondrosarcoma, because I don't know if you agree with that, but it, I, I, am, I am less aggressive with chondrosarcoma uh, mm -hmm. than with chordoma. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's your I opinion agree, yeah. about, about this? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I agree with you that chondrosarcoma is usually the, more like a benign tumor. So, and also it affected the radio surgery is very effective. So maybe if chondrosarcoma, maybe we should remove not we don't have to remove totally. Maybe if there is some residual part, maybe we can let leave it. And, but I think 
for me, maybe the third girl, you know, um, we usually recommend total rejection, even if it is a control cell phone. And also, okay. I think the 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 maybe the for patients surgical um, the risk of complication didn't change much, I think, because the tumor even if it is a control cell phone, the most of the part is very soft. It takes long time, but. I think if we approach from inside, we usually push the tumor from lateral to medial. There is not much change about the cranial nerve, the risk of cranial nerve function, I believe, I think. And also okay. I think this is young patients, so we have to remove all if possible. We don't have to, you know, perform the radio surgery or radiotherapy. So in that case, if this patient has elderly patient, I think we sh maybe we sh the biopsy and uh, the verification of pathology merit a little bit, but I think this is a young patient. So in that such case, I think we should recommend the total resection. Okay, that's a, that's a point. In in this situation. I, I have to say that with chondrosarcoma, my, my, uh, my strategy, surgical strategy, is not necessarily less aggressive during the case because I agree with you. If it's a soft tumor, you go after it and it's coming and, uh, and it doesn't make difference if it's a chordoma or a chondrosarcoma. For very calcified lesion, it may be different because as you showed in your video, sometimes it's like a rock block of calcification that uh, could be uh, difficult to remove. And, uh, and if it's a chondrosarcoma, I would probably have uh, 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 more a tendency to, to leave some, uh, some pieces of these blocks uh, behind. But one thing that would change uh, uh, significantly is also the, the strategy about uh, radiation huh, for, for, for chondrosarcoma. I don't know if you, if you have the same strategy, but. Uh, for chondrosarcoma, if the resection is, is good and uh, if, it's, uh, if it seems to be a slow growing tumor, I would, uh, I would not uh, recommend upfront uh, proton beam therapy, maybe. And just uh, wait and see. For chordoma, definitely complete resection is, uh, is the goal and, uh, and proton beam therapy uh, follows. I use the same with chordoma. Uh, uh, advising uh, proton beam therapy systematically or, or not necessarily? Um, if <coughs> we achieve the total resection, we just wait and observe, even in the chordoma case. But okay. if the, the, the pathology is very aggressive, we have to be very, observe very closely. In some patients, we recommend the MRI one month after the surgery. And in most of the case, we recommend in chordoma case, we recommend the surgery as the MRI the three months later. Okay. But chondrosarcoma case is more like, I think, the like benign tumor. So if we achieve total resection, we recommend the MRI, the systematically MRI for six months later. And okay. we never give the, to do the, 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 the systematic radiotherapy. Okay. We are more aggressive with chordoma. I have to say that we are systematically doing proton beam therapy after chordoma because, because long term it's a, it's a disease that have a, 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 a very important tendency to, to come back and to recure. But for chondrosarcoma, I think we have the same uh, same attitude. Mm -hmm. So so in this situation again, we we did uh, we did uh, on sorry we did a biopsy because yeah. the tumor was, was in the sphenoid sinus. Uh, so it was very easy, in fact, to have a, a piece of tissue for a biopsy. I agree that it, if the tumor is, is deeper and, the, and the, the biopsy is complex, then uh, uh, it's questionable. But here in this case, it was very easy to, to go with the endoscope open, enlarge the ostium of the sphenoid on, the, on one side, and then I have a piece of, uh, of, of tumor to analyze. It confirmed uh, the diagnosis of a chordoma, 
uh, with with good uh, good sign on the on the uh, immunohistological analysis on the on the molecular biology, but uh, we we then decided to go for uh, radical resection, but uh, giving us a maximum change chance of a good functional outcome, keeping the cranial nerve intact. And this is why uh, we prefer to do an endoscopic endonasal approach for the extradural part, and then to have an endoscopic endonasal approach, um, uh, combined petrosal approach for the intradural part. With the ability then to, to have a wide resection of the dura without having a fear for uh, a CSF leak. So this is here the, the video. Okay. So first stage uh, endoscopic endonasally uh, through one nostril. <coughs> we use this, uh, this chopsticks technique. Uh, trying to keep uh, all the endonasal structure intact. But uh, definitely I will consider in the future uh, trying or using maybe your, your technique. I'm still waiting for the speculum. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you told me you would give me a speculum. I'm still expecting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> you will come soon. So here is, uh, is a sphenoid sinus exposing the carotid artery uh getting into this uh, the cavernous sinus and, and the tumor was not as soft as expected in fact it was it was a little bit more fibrous that i would have expected it because it was very hyper t2 on the mri but in fact it was a little bit fibrous with uh, some calcification inside so less favorable than expected for uh, resection i see uh, but we achieved a nice, uh, a nice resection of the part of the tumor inside the cavernous sinus. Obviously, you have bleeding at the end, which is a good sign because it means that you have decompressed the cavernous sinus. If you don't have venous bleeding, usually it means that you left uh, some tumor behind. Here is, uh, is a resection. We see some arachnoid. Mm -hmm. uh, here is on the other side. Uh, because when you have a big extension on one side in the cavernous sinus, you should not forget that there is also another side. And uh, sometimes you focus on the biggest part, but you forgot that there is a small remnant on the opposite side. So we focused on, uh, on the clivus also. And uh, the goal here was to avoid a CSF leak, because if you have a CSF leak, then uh, you lose the advantage of, uh, of the two stages. So we were, when we start to see that we, we encircled the, the wall, the, the hole through which the tumor was going intradurally, when we saw the border of this hole, we decided to stop uh, on close with, uh, with the classic material, put some fat into the sphenoid sinus, and, uh, and we closed uh, uh, the mucosa uh, of the rostrum. And then for the second stage, uh, we waited, uh, 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 I would say, almost two months before doing the second stage. We wanted the scar to create a, a clear limit between intra and extradural, not to have a CSF leak after the transpetrosal approach, because here it's the same difficulty to close. So here is a combine. We did what we are calling now the, a kind of mini combine. Uh, with a, a very small incision. We are working on this now. And uh, mastoidectomy here. Uh, and roofing here, the, the, the sigmoid sinus. I know that you have also a, a mini technique for, for mastoidectomy and transpetrosal approach. Uh, we will maybe discuss about it for the next course because you have a very nice technique also endoscopic assisted for, for this kind of, uh, of approach. Here is the exposure of Kawase uh, triangle uh, on the anterior petrosal approach. We work in a more posterior angle here than the classic uh, combined petrosal for meningioma, for example. And here, after opening the dura and transposing uh, 
the sigmoid sinus, we had a very nice and wide corridor to really uh, control all the cranial nerve here. Cutting the, the tent, uh, we first ligate the superpetrolic sinus. We see the force here. Force was also uh, compressed by the tumor. In fact, all the cranial nerve were in contact uh, quite tight uh, adherent uh, to the tumor. So I was more comfortable uh, being transcranial with my microscope here uh, to completely free the, the tumor from the perforator's vessel cranial nerve. She was, uh, she was intact postoperatively, except that she had a, a forced nerve uh, uh, paresis uh, that she recovered uh, from uh, after, after a few weeks uh, uh, post-op, but otherwise uh, she was intact. We were also more comfortable to, to peel the tumor away from the brainstem, and you see that it was quite adherent to the brainstem. And I find it always difficult, I don't know if you have the same impression, to, 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 uh, to have an idea preoperatively of how it will, adherent, it will be adherent or not to the brainstem. It's not always easy to predict. Sometimes you have a thin layer of CSF around the tumor and you know that it will not be adherent. But when you don't have this, it's sometimes tough to predict if it will be adherent or not to the brainstem and to the vessels. We had some surprise where we thought it would be easy and in fact it was extremely adherent to the brainstem. This is the inferior view of the floor of the third ventricle with the mammary body. So at the end, we had a nice, uh, nice, this is dissection of the third nerve because here you see how the third nerve was completely uh, stretched by the tumor and, uh, and embedded almost by the tumor. And uh, I think it would have been difficult to, to, to control this with the same amount of uh, security, uh, of safety, uh, with the endonasal approach. But uh, <clears throat> do you have the same impression about how to predict uh, adherence to the brainstem? Yeah, it's often very difficult to, to verify if it, how, how much it adheres to the brainstem. But if we go through the, the, the privates, we can directly see the brainstem surface. So we can directly see if how much it adheres to the, the, the brainstem and also how much it other than to the vascular artery. So in that case, we just, as you, we, I agree to you and we just, you know, the, the scrape of the, the, the tumor and there is, a, we leave the very thin layer on the brainstem, but I think we recommend, I usually dissect from the pyramid because the, the, on the brainstem, especially for the pons, the, the damage of the, 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 the PR matter on the pons doesn't cause any neurological deficit. So, but the, if it strongly adheres to the vascular structure, maybe we have to leave some piece. But also I have an impression is if the, in, when we do the, the endoscopic transphenoidal approach, the approach route to the posterior cranial fossa is always a cribal recess. So it's not, sometimes it's not enough space. We don't have enough space. In that case, in this, the case like this, we have to combine the supracellar approach, which means we open the, the, the tubercular cell, and then we go through the, 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 the cribal recess and also tubercular cell just like the, the approach to the cranial pharyngeal. So in, but, this, in this specific case, if, we, if you would have done uh, an endoscopic endonasal approach, you would have also open uh, the tuberculum cellae to have a superior control of the, of the lesion above and below the pituitary gland, for example. I think first I try the, the transcriber approach alone and we look up the, the tumor margin. First, I remove the tumor, the, the muscle reduction, and then we find the, 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 the arachnoid space just behind the, the, the dosum cella. 
And if I see, if I can, if I think I can dissect the tumor from the, the third nerve or optic chiasm from below, I do not extend the, the surgical approach. But if I think it's difficult, maybe we go up to the, 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 the supracellular region and then we try the another approach. So okay. step by step, I enlarge it. I think it's the balance between the, the endoscopic transsusfenoidal approach and the transcranial approach. And I think you have very good hand in the endoscopic surgery and also about the transcranial approach. And I think the, your transcranial approach, your transpetrosal approach is, you know, very magnificent. But in our um, institution, transcranial approach and endoscopic approach, you know, the outcome is evident. The transcranial, the endoscopic approach is much better than transcranial approach, unfortunately. So I think it's a balance of the surgeon or in the institution. Okay. Well, I think it was a, it was a very nice, uh, very nice discussion. Yes, we have one uh, favor to ask you. Mm -hmm. We have another case that we have not treated yet. And uh, <laughs> we would like, we would like your, your opinion. It's a little bit similar. So okay. it will be based mainly on images. I guess you will have the same, uh, the similar proposal than uh, what, you, what you just proposed for, for this case we, we just talked about. But uh, I wanted to, to have your opinion. I know you don't have much time to, to analyze the images. But if you can give us your, your feeling about this, uh, this patient. So this lady <laughs> is uh, 46 years old. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And, Previous uh, one, cordoma or condor sarcoma? No, no, it was a cordoma. It was a cordoma. cordoma. Okay. Previous one was a cordoma. So this, this lady uh, is 46 years old. She, she has a, a diplopia because of a complete uh, six nerve on the left. And uh, she has some dysphagia. She has difficulty swallowing. And the voice uh, is changing in the last uh, few weeks. So she has uh, involvement of the lower uh, cranial nerve. She had two MRI until now in May and July. Uh, and there is no significant growth uh, during this uh, short period of time. It's a short period of time. It's two months. So it's not so much. And here are the images. Maybe we could enlarge the images for Professor Chin to be able to, to see it better. So it's, uh, it's a little bit different because there is more contrast enhancement. It's going quite low here in the area uh, of the condyle. In fact, it's infiltrating uh, the condyle from above. Uh, it's probably infiltrating the medial aspect of the jugular foramen. And there is also extension, uh, intradural extension into uh, the brainstem. I expect to, uh, the tumor to have more PL uh, adherence, maybe infiltration to the PL matter of uh, the brainstem. Mm -hmm. This is other images, uh, coronal and sagittal. Uh, this is T2. There is a, a slight edema of, uh, of the brainstem, which, is, uh, which was not the, the, the case with the previous uh, patient. <clears throat> and here is, uh, is the bone erosion. Uh, so I just come back to these images because I think it's the best one to as a base for discussion. Maybe we can, we can see you again, uh, Masairo. So yeah. here is the situation. She's, yeah. she's 46. She has lower cranial nerve uh, deficit, progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the situation has changed over the last two months, even if there is no visible uh, tumor growth. 
yeah. and the characteristic of the images is uh, is slightly different from it. What's yeah. what's your what's your thought about this uh, this patient? I think the image is not very typical for the chordoma or contour sarcoma because the T2 is uh, very different, and also the pattern of the enhancement is also different. So I think in this case, in this very case, I recommend the biopsy, transphenoidal endoscopic transphenoidal biopsy, because sometimes it could be a carcinoma or metastatic tumor, I think. Epidermoid carcinoma or something like this, yes. It, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's one of the suspicions that we have What's, what's, what was against it for me was that it was slow growing in two months, zero difference. We calculate the volume in two months. And, uh, but I agree with you that the biopsy, I think, is a good option here. There is also the bone erosion. You see mm -hmm. here uh, at the level of the sphenoid sinus, you have this thin shell of bone that remain between the tumor and uh, the lumen of the sphenoid sinus, there is a mm -hmm. thin shell of bone. And this, in my opinion, is more in favor of a slow growing process, yeah. maybe like, like cordoma. I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah. Used to, I have those cases and um, I thought it was cordoma and I start the resection. But the appearance during surgery, I noticed that the appearance was completely different more fibrous and like, you know, completely different. And, and I do the, the, the rapid diagnosis. I asked the rapid diagnosis for the, the pathologists and they said carcinoma. It's a, so squamous cell carcinoma. And I have two cases of like this, but as squamous cell carcinoma, it is this patient, the, the tumor is slowly progression. So it's not very typical. But it's possible, I think. So, in, if this is a carcinoma, maybe the EMT surgeon said that we should not do the, the extensive resection. Maybe biopsy okay. and okay. after that chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So maybe we Absolutely. have to, yeah, verify the diagnosis, and then at that time we start the the how to do that. Start to considering the how to do that. So if, if the diagnosis, I, I totally agree with you on the, on the I think we will do a, a biopsy like the patient before in this patient to make sure that we are uh, building a strategy uh, on the good diagnosis. But uh, let's consider that uh, the, the histology come back, uh, it is a cordoma. What, yeah. what would you do? I think in this case, the surface of the brain skin, the, the the surface of brainstem is very irregular, which means uh, maybe the tumor is strongly adherent to the PR matter and also it's very difficult to dissect it. If we try to dissect it, maybe we cause the dissemination of something if we, this one is a cordoma. So maybe we should remain it in the, the internal decompression if possible. And residual tumor should be treated by the, the radiotherapy, like proton beam radiation or gamma knife surgery. Okay, and you would do it endoscopically, endonasally, like, like, uh, like the patient before? Yes, I always do this kind of surgery, endoscopic transphenoidal approach. And uh, one, one issue with this uh, patient is that also she has cervical pain, and cervical mm -hmm. pain may be due to uh, condyle uh, destruction because the condyle is uh, is uh, is uh, significantly eroded. Uh, would you consider a fixation for this patient? Would you do it uh, immediately after your surgery? What what would you be? What would be your strategy for uh, stabilization? I think for this patient, when I see the the CT scan, the surface of the condylar surface. The articular surface of the condyle is still preserved. So maybe we should remove, we should leave the tumor in the condyle. And after that, we should fix it with the radiation. But even after that, if she had an instability of craniocervical uh, region, 
maybe we should recommend the, the, the fixation. But for the moment, we should recommend her some neck color or something, and we should recommend the radiotherapy, I think. So you would not fix uh, this patient before radiation. That's for that's that's what you just said. But after radiation, uh, you would not necessarily fix this patient. I'm not sure about that. But if she had a cranial cervical instability, still she had a cranial cervical instability. Maybe we should recommend the the, the fixation. But the, before radiotherapy, you know if. We fix with we, we implant the, the the metal material. It hamper also it hamper the the radiotherapy because radiologist cannot radiation oncologist cannot accurately calculate the radiation dose if there is a metal material there. So, Absolutely, we have the same we have the same experience with uh, fixation. Yes. Yeah. So maybe we should leave the the fixation at the last step for after radiation. So this, this was also our plan. If this patient has a cordoma confirmed by the biopsy, we, but, but still uh, at this age, we would still try to achieve uh, a complete resection. I agree that the brainstem may be the main issue. This is why I am thinking maybe of a combination like before of endoscopic on the open approach to try to achieve a complete resection in this patient. If we achieve, a, if, we, if we go for this aggressive resection, we also need to drill the bone, infiltrated bone of the lower clivus and condyle. So the plan was to use a collar, depending on the instability, the collar may be different, but to try to wait after proton beam therapy to do the fixation that I believe if we take the bone out of the condyle, which is an infiltrated bone, she then will need for sure uh, a fixation. So there is two different options, being less aggressive because we already know that we will not be able to achieve a complete resection because of brainstem adherences. And I agree that if you leave lesion on the brainstem, there is no need to be aggressive on the condyle. Another option is to try to have a strategy uh, with, with the purpose of achieving a complete resection. In this case, maybe a combination of approach, aggressive resection of the bone, but fixation after the radiation therapy. I think okay, it's, it's, it's cordoma case. Eh? Maybe we can, yeah. you know, anytime we can do the, the aggressive strategy, we can perform the aggressive strategy for first, I recommend them to the, the less invasive one and radiotherapy. If it's failed, it's failed. I think at that stage, I recommend her to the, the total resection with resection of the, the condyle and everything. So you mean after radiation therapy, if it fails? Yeah. Uh, my experience with uh, failure after proton beam therapy it's 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 at that, that stage. It's a it's a very difficult disease to control because it's it has recurred after proton beam therapy. So, our strategy is to try to to achieve a complete resection at the first surgery, followed by proton beam therapy. Partial resection with proton beam therapy after. I'm not sure that proton beam therapy on the global strategy is as efficient. In fact. Uh, yeah. We have shown in a, in a report of Bernard Georges uh, that uh, radiation therapy, the effect of radiation therapy after a partial resection is not very significant. Partial uh, proton beam therapy is efficient, especially efficient if you have achieved a complete resection. But uh, uh, it was very nice. Thank you very much, Masahiro. Uh, it's always nice to, to, to share with you because you have always uh, amazing ideas and techniques. And I saw your instruments during your videos. It's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. So thank you for sharing with us your experience. It was thank very you. nice. Thank you. J'espère à bientôt à Paris ou à Tokyo. <laughs> à bientôt. Merci. Salut. 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 <laughs>
Okay, so thank you very much for this morning uh, session. Uh, we will start again this afternoon uh, with the anterior petrosal approach. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the demonstration this morning. It was not all, not very easy because uh, the dura was uh, very thin, but uh, so I did few mistakes. But this is uh, this is the purpose also of those live. Uh, there was no uh, bleeding. Uh, sorry. There was not much bleeding, but uh, it was. Uh, it's always nice to 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 have to face uh, difficulties because it's uh, it illustrates the difficulties that we can face also uh, during surgery. So let's talk. Uh, uh, again uh, at 2, 2 p.m. this afternoon. Thank you very much.